Well, we are going live, so whatever you say can and will be held against you in a court of law from this point forward. Hello. We're back. It feels like it's been forever. And I did not get nearly as much done on all of this as I had hoped over the vacations, but that's okay. I got about four or five more ahead. Where I, when I say ahead, I mean like preparing full sheets. And that's what I try to do. I am done with the book, but it is good to be back. It is good to have you guys here because I was starting to sweat it as the time was getting close. And it's good to have the folks online that are joining us. I do know of a few who said they would be watching. If not now, then slightly thereafter. So we are back with C.S. Lewis. I hope your brains have all rested, that you're ready to get into this again. Uh, for fun and games, I went through my fun and games facts, and I think I have one we haven't done before, but I can't swear to it because this almost month off kind of cleared my brain. So if you've heard it before, just act like you haven't heard it before, and we'll just not go back. I won't remember anyway. Yeah, yeah, because I kept oh, looking brains. at it, and I was like, did I print this off to do this time since I had prepared? Last time, by the way, I think I had mentioned it, but we were going to meet two weeks ago, and then Alex got sick, and forget that. And Then I was on vacation, and then this week I've had to call in every night for jury duty, and knock on whatever I've gotten this far, so don't jinx it for the last day, people. We'll pray for you. None tomorrow. Yes, That's what I want. Yeah, it's been good. I've sweated it a little bit, but today was the only day it would have really messed things up. But we are here. Five fascinating facts about C.S. Lewis. You need some fingers? <laughs> Ah, the first one. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. R. Tolkien once went to a party dressed as polar bears, and it was not a costume party. According to the biographer, Tolkien went to a New Year's party in the 1930s as a polar bear wearing a sheepskin with his face painted white. In a more recent book, they also list Lewis as his fellow party guest similarly attired. Apparently they had very quirky, over-the-top sense of humor. <laughs> Don't get it. Tolkien, even though this isn't about Tolkien, was also well known to dress up as an axe-wielding Anglo-Saxon warrior and would chase his bewildered neighbor down the road. Wacky fun in Oxford. It's a little strange. Yeah. <laughs> Second fact, Lewis destroyed his first version of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when his friends criticized it, and he rewrote it from scratch. Oh, my gosh. They say this one might be a little questionable. It says he, he, he claims he had destroyed a novel for children, and they're not really sure whether it was entirely that novel. Maybe it was another one, but The Life of a Tortured Writer. Three, C.S. Lewis based the protagonist of his space trilogy on Tolkien. So they were good friends and apparently kind of used him. The space trilogy is sort of a science fiction trilogy that Lewis had written. Mm -hmm. Outer space, aliens, and worlds, and uh, apparently his protagonist was based on Tolkien. Um, I thought this was interesting. Once again, this is not a Tolkien class, but it's funny to hear some of these things. The differences between Tolkien and C.S. Lewis go deeper than the former's dislike of the latter's Narnia books. Hmm. Tolkien didn't like the allegory portion of it. Or the fact that Tolkien was Roman Catholic while Lewis was a Protestant. While Lewis was an engaging public speaker and popularizer of medieval literature, Tolkien was, by all accounts, a terrible lecturer, incoherent and often inaudible in Kingsley and Mrs. Assessment, and one of the world's worst lecturers, according to Douglas Gray. Wow. How do you like that on your teaching review? <laughs> the scholarly contrasts extend to Lewis's lack of interest in textual editing compared with Tolkien's 
forensic and sometimes pedantic obsession with the niceties of scholarly annotation. Tolkien didn't write much in the way of academic monographs, preferring editions of medieval text. He also hated allegory because it reduced the meaning of a work to a simple X equals Y model. By contrast, Lewis gave us The Allegory of Love, one of his books. Lewis died on the same day of, as Aldous Huxley, an author, but their deaths were overshadowed by a more famous death. We talked about that with JFK. And Lewis's fictional world building started at a young age. Uh, he loved writing, and he would, he was, as a child, he would write books and write stories that would take place. So kind of he was born to be a writer. That was his thing. They're a weird bunch of folks. It's okay. Those English authors and writers and myth makers. Interesting bunch. So, we are on now. Book three. Yes, okay, good. Everybody's nodding like yes. That is where I am as well. I can only wait for my eventual lecturer reviews to come out and everybody write. He's the world's worst teacher. Oh, incoherent rambles. So we had gotten through books one and two. This is not so much a section book three, a Christian behavior. It's not so much talking about God or Jesus and salvation. We're talking about behavior, kind of beliefs in a will, if you way. It, in a way, if you will. We're going to be getting into a lot of things that flow out of, if you believe in this, and if you believe in this, therefore this is how you're going to act. This is almost going to be getting into third use of the law type territory. Because we're going to be talking, especially today, we're going to be talking about morality how you act, how you act towards others. This is all, all coming from a Christian basis. And he tells us that at the end of his section, so I don't want to steal any of his thunder. But this is not, this part now is not, like the first part, book one, we really got into, hmm, we know about right and wrong, we feel right and wrong, we see right and wrong, we know we don't deal rightly with people. Somebody's trying to tell us something. Hmm, there is a God. Then in book two, we kind of went with, well, this God is trying to communicate with us. We know we can't do right, but we know we can't save ourselves. Hmm, there must have been a Savior. And gets us to Jesus, and that's kind of where book two goes. And now book three is getting more into how do we act? How do we view the world? How do we deal with things? How do we deal with others around us? And that's where this section of the book is going to go. Okay? Thoughts? Agreements? Disagreements? Yeah, I, I sometimes think that Christian behavior is not, un, not unlike, you know, the, the, the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, most, many, many, many times we're, we're not behaving as we should. Right. You know, we don't, right? There, there's no, there's no doubt. Um, there are non-Christians that act very, that have very good behavior. Mm -hmm. Yep. Christians that don't. Yeah. Yep. There, you, you can't, you can't debate that. That's certainly for sure. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about where some of that comes from. So I this think. is more like how Christians should be. Yes. Not how they. Not how they do behave. And it, it'll give you an interesting model of thinking about morality. I really like the model he has for, you know, how, how we as a society are. And it'll tell you exactly kind of where we come off the rails, especially right now. Um, but we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want don't to get into all that and then have two minutes to say, okay, we're done. Any questions? Uh, so why don't we open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get in and read this section. 
Um, yeah. Let's do that. Father, thank you. We thank you for bringing us back. We thank you for the summer we had. That we're wrapping up. Some of us are still wrapping up. It's not over yet, but we're transitioning now into the fall year, the school year. Um, even if we don't have kids at home, life changes. We're getting busy again. Uh, we just thank you that we, we've got these activities and we've got this church here to come and gather at. We thank you that we're able to come here to listen to your word, to think about life, and just how we do interact with our neighbors and all those around us, and, and what could we do better. Father, we just ask that you extend your grace to us, which we know you have, and just grant us wisdom. Bless us as we get into this, as we read this. Show us Show us some of your light reflecting through here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I had picked two scriptures. There's probably a whole bunch of different ones that we can get into. But before I read this, a couple of scriptures I wanted to think about as we're reading. Got my light back. Had to go find it. She hid my light away and... It's dark in here, and my eyes are getting worse for trying to read, so here we go. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul had written, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Glorify God with what you do. That's the first one. Second one comes from Peter. It's always good if you have a Paul to throw a Peter in there if it helps. First uh, Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Quite the standard to think about. As Paul, Paul said, not Paul, you know, we don't always act like we should, but we need to remember the holiness that we were made for something more, something better. The other and, Paul also said that. Yeah, the other Paul <laughs> did too. He did. He did. I wonder if I should start referring to Paul 1 and Paul 2. And we'll, <laughs> it's like when we're, we're here at church, I have Alex 1 and my Alex, who's Alex 2, when I'm up there, I always like, hey, Alex 1, and he smiles over there, so he likes it. So anyway, let us get in. Hmm? Which is the third Alex? Stro. Stro, that's right. Okay, yeah. All righty. Chapter 1. Of book three, the three parts of morality. There's a story about a schoolboy who was asked what he thought God was like. He replied that as far as he could make out, God was the sort of person who was always snooping around to see if anyone is enjoying himself and then trying to stop it. And I'm afraid that is the sort of idea that the word morality raises in a good many people's minds. Something that interferes. Something that stops you having a good time. In reality, moral rules are directions for running the human machine. Every moral rule is there to prevent a breakdown or a strain or a friction in the running of that machine. That is why these rules at first seem to be constantly interfering with our natural inclinations. When you are being taught how to use any machine, the instructor keeps on saying, no, don't do it like that. Because of course, there are all sorts of things that look all right and seem to you the natural way of treating the machine, but do not really work. Some people prefer to talk about moral ideals rather than moral rules and about moral idealism rather than moral obedience. 
Now, it is, of course, quite true that moral perfection is an ideal in the sense that we cannot achieve it. In that sense, every kind of perfection is, for us humans, an ideal. We cannot succeed in being perfect car drivers or perfect tennis players or in drawing perfectly straight lines. But there is another sense in which it is very misleading to call moral perfection an ideal. When a man says that a certain woman or house or ship or garden is his ideal, he does not mean, unless he is rather a fool, that everyone else ought to have the same ideal. In such matters, we are entitled to have different tastes and therefore different ideals. But it is dangerous to describe a man who tries very hard to keep the moral law as a man of high ideals, because this might lead you to think that moral perfection was a private taste of his own and that the rest of us were not called on to share it. That would be a disastrous mistake. Perfect behavior may be as unattainable as perfect gear changing when we drive, but it is, nece it is a necessary ideal prescribed for all men by the very nature of the human machine, just as perfect gear changing is an ideal prescribed for all drivers by the very nature of cars. And it would be even more dangerous to think of oneself as a person of high ideals because one is trying to tell no lies, instead of only a few lies, or never to commit adultery, instead of committing it only seldom, or not to be a bully, instead of only being a moderate bully. It might lead you to become a prig and to think you were rather a special person who deserved to be congratulated on his idealism. In reality, you might just as well expect to be congratulated because whenever you do a sum, you try to get it quite right. To be sure, perfect arithmetic is an ideal. You will certainly make some mistakes in some calculations. But there is nothing very fine about trying to be quite accurate at each step in each sum. It would be idiotic not to try, for every mistake is going to cause you trouble later on. In the same way, every moral failure is going to cause trouble, probably to others, and certainly to yourself. By talking about rules and obedience instead of ideals and idealism, we help to remind ourselves of these facts. Now let us go a step further. There are two ways in which the human machine goes wrong. One is when human individuals drift apart from one another or else collide with one another and do one another damage by cheating or bullying. The other is when things go wrong inside the individual, when the different parts of him, his different faculties and desires and so on, either drift apart or interfere with one another. You can get the idea plain if you think of us as a fleet of ships sailing in formation. The voyage will be a success only in the first place if the ships do not collide and get in one another's way, and secondly, if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order. As a matter of fact, you cannot have either of these two things without the other. If the ships keep on having collisions, they will not remain seaworthy very long. On the other hand, if their steering gears are out of order, they will not be able to avoid collisions. Or, if you like, think of humanity as a band playing a tune. To get a good result, you need two things. Each player's individual instrument must be in tune. And also, each must come in at the right moment so as to combine with all the others. But there is one thing we have not yet taken into account. We have not asked where the fleet is trying to get to or what piece of music the band is trying to play. The instruments might, all, might be all in tune and might all come in at the right moment. But even so, the performance would not be a success if they, if they had been engaged to provide dance music and actually played nothing but dead marches. And however well the fleet sailed, its voyage would be a failure if it were meant to reach New York and actually arrived in Calcutta. Morality then seems to be concerned with three things. 
Firstly, with fair play and harmony between individuals. Secondly, with what might be called tidying up or harmonizing the things inside each individual. Thirdly, with the general purpose of human life as a whole. What man was made for, what course the whole fleet ought to be on, what tune the conductor of the band wants it to play. You may have noticed that modern people are nearly always thinking about the first thing and forgetting the other two. When people say in the newspapers that we are striving for Christian moral standards, they usually mean that we are striving for kindness and fair play between nations and classes and individuals. That is, they are thinking only of the first thing. When a man says about something he wants to do, it can't be wrong because it doesn't do anyone else any harm. He is thinking only of the first thing. He is thinking it does not matter what his ship is like inside, provided that he does not run into the next ship. And it is quite natural when we start thinking about morality to begin with the first thing, with social relations. For one thing, the results of bad morality in that sphere are so obvious and press on us every day. War and poverty and graft and lies and shoddy work. And also, as long as you stick to the first thing, there is very little disagreement about morality. Almost all people at all times have agreed, in theory, that human beings ought to be honest and kind and helpful to one another. But though it is natural to begin with all that, if our thinking about morality stops there, we might just as well not have thought at all. Unless we go on to the second thing, the tidying up inside each human being, we are only deceiving ourselves. What is the good of telling the ships how to steer so as to avoid collisions if, in fact, they are, all, they are such crazy old tubs that they cannot be steered at all? What is the good of drawing up on paper rules for social behavior if we know that, in fact, our greed, cowardice, ill-temper, and self-conceit are going to prevent us from keeping them. I do not mean for a moment that we ought not to think and think hard about improvements in our social and economic system. What I do mean is that all is that, all that thinking will be mere moonshine unless we realize that nothing but the courage and unselfishness of individuals is ever going to make any system work properly. It is easy enough to remove the particular kinds of graft or bullying that go on under the present system. But as long as men are twisters or bullies, they will find some new way of carrying on the old game under a new system. You cannot make men good by law, and without good men you cannot have a good society. That is why we must go on to think of the second thing, of morality inside the individual. But I do not think we can stop there either. We are now getting to the point at which different beliefs about the universe lead to different behavior. And it would seem at first sight very sensible to stop before we got there and just carry on with those parts of morality that all sensible people agree about. But can we? Remember that religion involves a series of statements about facts, which must be either true or false. If they are true, one set of conclusions will follow about the right sailing of the human fleet. If they are false, quite a different set. For example, let us go back to the man that says that a thing cannot be wrong unless it hurts some other human being. He quite understands that he must not damage the other ships in the convoy. But he honestly thinks that what he does to his own ship is simply his own business. But does it not make a great difference whether his ship is his own property or not? Does it not make a great difference whether I am, so to speak, the landlord of my own mind and body, or only a tenant responsible to the real landowner? If somebody else made me for his own purposes, then I shall have a lot of duties which I should not have if I simply belong to myself. Again, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever. 
and this must be either true or false. Now there are a good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were going to live only 70 years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I am going to live forever. Perhaps my bad temper or my jealousy are gradually getting worse, so gradually that the increase in 70 years will not be very noticeable. But it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is the precisely correct technical term for what it would be. And immorality makes this other difference. Immortality, that's a different word. Immortality makes this other difference, which, by the by, has a connection with the difference between totalitarianism and democracy. If individuals live only 70 years, then a state or a nation or a civilization, which may last for a thousand years, is more important than an individual. But if Christianity is true, then the individual is not only more important, but incomparably more important, for he is everlasting, and the life of a state or a civilization compared with his is only a moment. It seems, then, that if we are to think about morality, we must think of all three departments. Relations between man and man, things inside each man, and relations between man and the power that made him. We can all cooperate in the first one. Disagreements begin with the second and become more serious with the third. It is dealing with the third that the main differences between Christian and non-Christian morality come out. For the rest of this book, I am going to assume the Christian point of view and look at the whole picture as it will be if Christianity is true. There's a lot there. I love his example of the uh, gear shifting to drive the car properly. Talk about anachronisms. I thought maybe I should put something at the bottom of my sheet for that, but then I figured this crowd would know what gear shifting is. For the eventual legal court case that comes up, I just want to point out Mary is holding a Coca-Cola in her hand when she says she wants to drink and drive. Very appropriate. Whew. He gives you a lot there to think about how we interact. And I mean, frankly, I think this is very timely as well because isn't this what we're dealing with now? I mean, not that you're not dealing with it all the time, but there's kind of a great shift in, in the morality and how we deal with one another in society. And right now the boats are kind of getting a little close. And we're all starting to bump into each other because some of us think we ought to go this way, some of us think we ought to go that way, and some people are just trying to leave the fleet. Kind of going in all sorts of directions. At this point, he is talking about interacting with your neighbor, the world. I'm hoping the church is at least somewhat in, in kind of the same direction, even though it may not be 100%, but maybe we're floating in the same direction. I think we're, we're starting to bump up against a morality that's very, very different. Within the church? No, out, outside, oh, yes. completely. Some of that may be creeping in to the church as well, but so just the of the potentially right. it's it's starting to go that way. But anyway, big thoughts. Uh, let's go through parts of his argument. He uses in the beginning, he talks about using the word rules, moral rules versus moral ideals. What's the difference and why does he make that differentiation when talking about moral rules versus moral ideals. 
why did he say he made that differentiation that we should really be talking about moral rules? See what happens. We all go on break for a month. And <laughs> Actually, I have nothing to think about for over. Yeah, I know. It hurts. It hurts <laughs> to get it going again. So, when you talk about rules, what do you think of? Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. This is the way things are designed, and this is the way things ought to be. And ideals would be shooting for something. This is the rules are an absolute. Yeah, the rules say this is how you should treat somebody. This is how you should do what you should do. An ideal, he said, was kind of like, I have in my mind the picture, you know, he used it briefly, the picture of the ideal woman. You got her. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> ideal moved along the ideas of taste. Taste. You know, I prefer. Mm -hmm. And he says, when we're talking about morality, if you're getting into preferences, you're, you're what, what's the point? I prefer this, I prefer that. It's almost like you can't have a discussion. If you say, this That's is how... Like the cop pulls you over from 70, and you want to prefer to have gone 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in the beginning of this, he's saying, you know, we should really be talking about moral rules. And those rules are in place in his mind because the rules are there to run what he calls the human machine. And I will equate this to God's law. We think of God's law as a negative thing many times. It convicts, it constrains. But the third use of the law tells the Christian, the one who is saved, that God's law guides and builds up. It'll show you holiness. You know, you won't achieve it, but it's the way the machine was supposed to be run. Thou shalt not murder. It doesn't suggest thou might not want to murder. You know, you should, you should honor your mother and your father, not eh, if you feel like it, I'll try to be a little better to them today. You know, the point is that the, 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 the law, the moral rules that are in place are the way we should be running. Now, what the second question, is it possible to achieve this moral perfection? If we call it rules, are we hamstringing ourselves? We can't. We can't what? You can't achieve moral perfection. Okay, I was just waiting for a complete sentence there. Sorry. We can't. <laughs> we can't yeah. what? We can't get up? We can't run we can't away? I it. can't do it. Can't do yes. And that doesn't mess with his argument at all. He's not claiming we can. Once again, we get back into sort of the, the first and second books. Remember, should, I should do this, but I don't. He's like, of course. Of course you're not going to be perfect in how you treat people and what you do. You're not going to run yourself perfectly. That doesn't mean it's not a rule. It just means you're not getting there. There are certain rules for diet and exercise that tell you the right ways to eat, how you should exercise to build up a strong, healthy body, how much sleep you should get. I have not yet achieved them by a lot, and the evidence shows it's the way life goes. I mean, but that doesn't mean that those rules are wrong. It means that I'm not working my way through the rules. That's kind of what he's saying. We can't talk about morality. If we're just talking about morality in the sense of, well, I like to do this. I only like to kick two puppies a day. You know, yay for me. That makes my morality great. And he's like, well, you know, probably we shouldn't go around kicking puppies. I think that's a good rule. <laughs> Like today when I was driving Lydia. How many puppies did you kick? <laughs> Where is this story going? Was, okay. 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 It's a very side, <laughs> side track. So I was kind of like MMD. I always get sidetracked. I'm actually very sleepy today. Remember, you are on tape. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I won't say anything. So 
So anyway, now I can hardly remember what I was going to say after all that. <laughs> so driving Lydia today to see her mom and switch cars, blah, blah, blah. And um, she's like, Grandma, go faster, go faster. Because she had the window open. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't. It's The speed limit says something. It, there's rules that tells you whether you can go fast or not. And it's for reasons to be safe. And she did the same thing when there was like a red light, you know. Grandma, don't stop. You got to go. And I'm like, you know, we might want to go, but the rules are there for a good reason. You know, my ideal, I, her ideal is having the wind blowing in her hair and, you know, going and no cares of, you know, like a puppy. Yeah, what's going on, you know? Good comparison, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> So. That that was an amusingly <laughs> apt description of the of the question and, at hand. But trying to explain it to her, a two and a half year old, you know, there's okay. here for it's a reason. Like God trying to explain the rules to us. It's yeah. Yeah. Tough. yeah. It's not bad. Someday when we post bail for Mary and we realize she's been doing a hundred and a twenty five, we'll understand how it happened. <laughs> With Lydia's hair <laughs> in the breeze. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and drinking my coke. <laughs> Trying. So after he gets to this point of the discussion, he, he works in a few other things, but he gets down to basically there are three things that morality, when we talk about morality, that they are concerned with. What are the three things? If you have to, think about the, the example he used. You're sailing in a fleet. What's the number one most important thing not to do when the fleet is sailing? Collide into another ship. Yep, so morality is concerned first with... Oh, the interaction with others. With others. Second... The internal. Yeah. That we keep our boats clean and running well. Yeah, because if we don't do that, what happens? We create some apart. collisions. Yeah. <laughs> we fall apart. And then the third thing... This would be our relationship to God, between us and God. Yep, which once again, as he says, the third thing is an assumption, but it, it is the Christian assumption that we were created for a purpose, and if we've been created by a creator, there's something for us to do, you know, for a reason. We weren't just plopped down here randomly that we go and that we do, that we're sailing in a way. So those three things, the way we interact with others, um, the way we are internally, which is what God is always cleaning up in us, mm -hmm. and the third way, which is our, our um, relationship with the one who created us. In a way, it also sort of interacts with the two tables of the law, mm -hmm. you know, the First three, dealing with us and our relationship with God. The second one, dealing with our relationship between one another. It's another way of thinking about it. And the third one is kind of the result therein of the Spirit's work within us, cleaning us up internally. Um, why do you think people tend to t focus on the first one? The first one being? Interaction with others. So why, do, why, why is that where society goes to and not the other two? Well, it's the only thing that society, so to speak, can control. Right. And sees. Mm -hmm. Why we have police. And we can see it. Yeah. If somebody hurts me, I know if, if I'm hurting myself, nobody else knows it. If I'm hurting God, nobody knows it yet. Um, yeah. Can be. Does anybody deal with any of the other two? Well, we have to deal with it ourselves. And God deals with it. And ourselves. who else helps? Ourselves. Others. I, I mean, are we sitting in a church? Yeah. Does a pastor not oh. care for our souls? Does a pastor not come and? You know, so that, that's, I mean, the society at large is not a church, obviously. So when we're talking about this big societal point of view, they're going to have a hard time getting into those other two. What's going to lead to, to self-improvement? Well, go to the bookstore. Start looking at all the shelves of books. How do you... 
I'm not sure who you offended today, that you're all the way on this side of the room. I keep looking over here, and I'm like, Rebecca's over on this side. I have to come over and make sure I... Yet yeah, nobody <laughs> wanted to sit by you. I'll just, I, I keep focusing over here, and I'm like, poor Rebecca's over here. Um, but, you know, society has all sorts of thoughts and ideas about how to improve yourself. Um, No, right. no, there's some, I mean, thing, when I see things about time management, you know, probably good ideas. Follow something and figure out how to manage your time. Not a bad way. It's not exactly a thou shalt, but it's, you know, probably good. No, um, it's not unlike God's laws and, you know, like the laws of Civil well, and the biggest, the biggest thing, well, it's going to kind of get in this next question. I say, why is focusing on the second thing in the list so important? He gets into this discussion. I mean, the second thing is what? Internal. Internal. Focusing on self, improving the self, keeping the boat shined and taken care of. Why is that so important? Why does Lewis say it's so important? I don't know why Lewis says it, but I think why I think. Why you think so. And I think I think like Lewis. I think you do too. <laughs> Is you have to have yourself in order in order to help others or to be a genuine person, to, to be able to do all these other things. You have to be able to have yourself and your relationship with God and have all those things in place before you can <laughs> She's a I really wish we had the camera focused down here <laughs> I believe we have another opinion coming on over argue? there no no okay Well, and we haven't gotten too much into Lewis's thoughts about sanctification. Okay. What does, you know, I mean, he's speaking from a very pragmatic, natural theology, na natural philosophy kind of point of view. How do we interact with one another? Do we do good things ourselves? Um, he starts to get at it, and the one thing I hadn't heard anybody actually mention yet is yes we are flesh and blood 70 years give or take we have but how long do we live eternally eternally we go on the reason why that 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 cleanup is so important is because we are eternal creatures according to lewis now he says, if you bring your bad habits in, you know, sure, now you're just kind of angry. Imagine an eternity of being angry. That could be a problem. The flip side of that, however, of doing little nicer things and eventually you get to an eternity of doing nice things only comes about because Jesus changes you. And he doesn't sort of explicitly say that. 
like you don't work your way. It almost sounds like he's saying work salvation here. It, it floats right on the, the, if you work and you're nice and you carry that niceness into eternity with you, that niceness develops. You know, and it, it's, I, I don't think that's what he means, but I think from just a natural philosophical point of view, he's saying think about the things you do and the way you act and the thoughts you have. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost a Romans 1 position talking about sin. You know, God left them to their own devices and the sin spirals and gets worse and worse and then just carry that out into eternity and what does he say that's called? Hell. Hell. Separation from God, sin, and all of these things going on. That's kind of what he's... Could you think of, instead of a ship, maybe like an incubation vessel, a culture plate or something, you just let it go and it just kind of breeds and multiplies. Incubation plate traveling in the same direction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, it, it, it carries all the bad things. Yeah. yeah, this is, I mean, this is, so this is where I sort of struggle with Lewis trying to understand what I know of theology, carrying it into his philosophical view of how the world works. And, and certainly when one is dealing with society at large, I mean, if we at least started here, I think life would be a whole heck of a lot better if we all sort of agreed which way we were going, even if we didn't have the theological bent for it. We'd certainly be on the right way. Um, Here's something. For a, a lot of us, when we were in grade school particularly, um, if you, people were pretty much taught to follow the golden rule, yeah. to others as you would have them do unto you and, and there were probably more Christian, probably a higher percentage of kids' families went to church but not everybody's. But at school you were all just expected to know right from wrong and do the right thing and if you did the wrong thing you were corrected for it and nobody made a big deal about it and the ship just seemed to go smoother at least that was the expectation Mm -hmm. um, it was simpler times. Mm -hmm. Was it? And the, 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 only, the only thing I have to say towards that is those times got us to these times. True. So they might not have been as together as we well, envision everything. Like, child. Yeah, yeah, no, and I mean, I'm, I'm not... Faulting. I mean, I, nothing is ever simple. You know, the boats may not have been as far out of line, but I'm not sure they were always in line. You um, didn't question either, right and wrong. You just didn't question it. You were told, and that's what you did. Whereas now, I think people tend to want to know why. Sure. You're you get taught. smacked if you did. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, yeah maybe. I, I would offer a differing point of view. They're, they're, they're questioning. They don't want to know why. They're just taught to question. That, that, that is different. Truly searching and questioning and coming before God and saying, where am I? What's going on? Why did you do this? That's one thing. And then just saying, like, why do you believe that? That's nonsense. Is a different thing. So... Sure. So where did I get? Where am I right now? I'm trying well, I'm to figure. Focusing on the second thing. Why? Yeah, that's so right. We were talking about improving. people. We were talking about people because. Improving ourselves. Yeah. But, but I think uh, what also we have to remember is that because you know I grew up in an era too where that was the thing. You know, I'm okay. You're okay is, you know, it was all about self, you know, it, where it went from way one way to the other. That, mm -hmm. The that, 60s. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, you have to feel good about yourself. It's all about me. Oh, it still is. Right. But from a Christian perspective, it's, I mean, you do have to have a cleaned up self in order to help others, and you have to have a cleaned up self to be able to 
have a good relationship with God, but um, say that not, out say that out loud again. I don't know if I can. You have to have a good relationship. Cleaned up self. A cleaned up self in order to have a good relationship with God. What do you mean by that? By good relationship. What do you mean by cleaned up self? Aware of aware of what's right and wrong. And so God won't have a relationship with you until you're cleaned up? No. Okay, that's where I I'm trying. Good. No, okay. I good. Said good relationship. So what I mean is I mean I mess up all the time. But I think a good relationship means going to God with your sins and your problems. And so whether you're, you're still screwing up, but you're, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. He's trying to get me to. <laughs> so, but I also think that for a while there, it was all about me. But I think you still have to keep in mind that it is still about me, but not in the way society says it is now, right? I mean, you have to, okay, now I'm talking just because I feel like I'm supposed to fit something in that makes sense. Makes sense. But you understand what I'm saying, right? So how do you get the cleaned up self? Having a relationship with God. I, I think we need a relationship with God, not necessarily what you'd think of as a good relationship. We can't turn our backs on God. Right. That's what I mean by good relationship. Because I'm still saying if I do something wrong, which would be turning my back on God, would be, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good way to put it. <laughs> okay. Take a bit way good. Just a relationship with God. A relationship with God. And you can have a bad, horrible self, as long as you can go back, feel that you can go to God to help you through that. To help you With your bad, up. horrible self. Yeah, to help you clean yourself up. How's that? Is that better? I think so. <laughs> I, 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 well, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to stay away from is the idea that you self-improve so mm. that God likes you, and mm. that's not that's not not I don't even think Lewis is saying that. Uh, that's not what but Lewis... But you know, I think that's a very good point because I think sometimes, even though I know better, I think, I don't know, I think maybe sometimes I do think that. Oh, of course we all think it. I mean, that's just you general know, human nature. What can I do? want to be a good person. What can I do to make myself better? Right. Probably in and of itself, not a bad thought, not an evil thought. But the next step of it is, well, I'm better now because I have done that. That's There's where you start there. getting right. in trouble. Right. Right. You right. know, I am better now. Darn it, God's lucky to have me because right. yeah. I am a good guy today and I went and did this and that. But I'm cleaned up now. <laughs> I, would say, I would say the thought of God, what can I do today? Where would you have me go? How can I do better? That's, that's mm -hmm. you're talking sanctification now. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the leading of the spirit and the cleaning of the, the self. Darn it, God, I am so good today. I've had another day where I did nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's where it all right. falls apart. Mm-hmm. But a, a lot of times, uh, other materials that I have read is, it, it does, it really, it Christian material that I have read really borders on that. I did it because I wanted to. Yeah. God gave me the strength to do it and sidesteps my sin where I don't have to confess anything. I don't have to repent of anything. Mm -hmm. But it, it ignores the pervasiveness, the saturation of sin in even our workspace it is yeah. it boils right down to workspace when in fact you just beg God for forgiveness and hold on with your fingernails and don't let them go no matter how ugly it gets please God 
Um, so this next question then gets a little silly because we've kind of talked through this, this idea. Does it make a difference if we believe we've been created by God or not? Does it? Yes. Absolutely. Why? We're accountable. For who? Yeah. Didn't say to who. Oh, for who? Yeah. We're accountable for... That's it? Love. Love involves what? Sacrifice. Faith. Uh oh. This is how Jesus. I kill time. I just Jesus. Jesus. Very good. <laughs> what what about our neighbors? Oh. Oh. I mean in order to love, we have to love others. others. Love yeah. yeah. So this is I mean, this is why this idea of do you believe in God or not is kind of foundational to this model he's putting together of how we interact for the fleet all to be sailing in the same direction we kind of have to have the same goal in mind when goals change fleet starts having a hard time overall goals change the fleet has a problem um, sometimes we can all be sailing the right way, kind of, for some of the right reasons. Sometimes our goals are close, and then sometimes things pop out, and then which way are the boats going? I feel like I should have little bath toys on a table in front of me, and then we can just see. Go get some rubber duck. Rubber duck. Nah, <laughs> save. Oh, that would be awesome. But no, for the moment, I believe we are safe. Um, but it's going to make, I mean, I guess part of my, my, my thinking here is don't fool yourself. His model is a way of dealing with the outside world. We have to think of ourselves together. We're all here. Well, what we do for one another, we do for God. Yes. But you're going to have people that you're going to deal with who will not believe any of that. So we have to make sure that we're aware of their opinions too and that there will be points of con the boats are going to run into one another you, you know what I'm saying like the well, models can never control what someone else thinks no oh I can I sit and look at them <laughs> I try it with Alex all the time he's sitting there and I sit mm, how's that working for you Dan. <laughs> not even remotely close <laughs> but but don't, I guess what I'm saying is with this model that he's created, this way of looking at it, don't confuse the fleet with the church. They're not the same. The way he's talking about it, the fleet is your civilization, your, your people, your town, your whatever his nation I mean he's thinking you know time of war so he's thinking about England and we're all going the same direction it, it, even though it's not the church it's it's how we relate to one another that God's looking at yeah oh absolutely I'm it not it doesn't matter if you're relating to someone inside the church or outside the church that's important right one's a, One's just as important as the other. Right. I'm just, all I'm trying to say is it's not, at some point there are going to be those that are part of the church who say, hey, we're heading to New York, and others outside of the church that are like, no, 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 it's not New York, we're going to, to Calcutta, to use his example. And how does the fleet move forward there? We're still the fleet. But that's where you're going to start getting into the conflicts. That, that, that's where the admiral deals with it. Yeah. Well, and maybe that's it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, matters. maybe that's maybe that's the final point of the lesson. Let the admiral deal with it. But uh, ultimately, that's that's sort of his picture of society, not his picture of the church. Not that it wouldn't apply within a strict church sense, but because if your church is having those problems. You know, if your church doesn't know which way it's going, they're going to have those problems, too. So the Lewis Method of Organization, I think we could put a program together and sell it to churches and make a few bucks. You're a fleet. Go tell them. 
So what about his point about individuals versus nation states? Did you understand the point he was trying to make there? So, Sorry to look up on the phone. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's why I really had to go back to paper for all of this stuff. I tried starting this on my Kindle and it was not working well. It's hard to go back and forth like that. How long do people live? 70 years, 70, 80 years. Is that what we all agreed on? Uh, I think that's what he mentioned in there, yeah. 70 years. If you believe that. If you believe that a person lives 70, 80 years and it's but done. You were saying that we exist yeah. forever. This is a yeah. part of well, eternity. Well, a nation so, exists for a long time. If, if people live 70, 80 years, if a nation lives, to use that term, exists for 300 years, which is more important? A ladder. A ladder. A ladder. Actually, the people. People are always more important than the nation. Nah, people won't be around. If I gotta wait 30 years, you'll be gone and we move on it to the next one. Is more important than the individual. If individuals live only 70 years, then a state or a nation or a civilization which may last for a thousand years is more important than the individual. But if Christianity is true, then the individual is not only more important, but incomparably more important for he is everlasting and the life of a state or a civilization compared with his is only a moment individuals are always more important that's what that's the nation a, is based on. That's, that's what our nation is based on the importance of the individual and where did they get that idea christian that's the point that's the point he's God. making but keep in mind the american nation is a very small blip on the radar of nations that existed in the world throughout time. Nations. Hmm? We're not over with yet. Well, no, but I'm just saying, you know, that his, what he's trying to say is that if you are a person that only believes man is 70 years and done, mm -hmm. then the nation has bigger things to do, and it's not necessarily dependent upon you. But if you are a person who believes that humans live eternally and have value mm -hmm. that's what he's saying by living eternally is that you have a value then you're infinitely more important mm -hmm. now you're infinitely more important because God loves you right. and doesn't love I nations mean, right. he loves you it's hard to believe he doesn't love the US <sighs> <laughs> I think God has a C-SPAN <laughs> connection, and he just sits and goes, what, what? Yeah, what, what, what did they put down there today? Um, I think what C.S. Lewis is creating there from a natural philosophical point of view is a matter of perspective. What you deal with when you deal with human beings matters for eternity. What you deal with with nations is there for a time. Maybe a long time, maybe a short time. You never know. Well, because remember, once again, these discussions are to deal with folks outside of here who may not yeah. agree. Although he certainly had a much easier audience, I think, in England at that time. I mean, if you've got a national church and all of that in England, then you have a little, little easier basis for your discussions. But anyway, so the point being from here on out, the way Christians think about morality, the way Christian behavior occurs and why we do what we do, He's going to take it from a Christian point of view, not from any other. He's going to assume that Scripture is true. He's going to assume God is true, that our eternal lives are true. And that's where he'll be going from here. So 
he's basically saying I won't be arguing these next things from first principles. I'm not going to take it all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to be able to say we do this because God says so or because it's, it's good for the eternal soul and not go back to a beginning point to continue. So he's going to now make a turn and speak more as a theologian. Slightly. I mean, it's still still very philosophical, but they're, they're yeah, you know. Once again, he doesn't, when I think theologian, I think more of scriptural references. I come in and we read this part of the Bible and we talk about what it shows us. Um, which he never really does here. It doesn't mean he didn't read the Bible. He actually had a very high view of Scripture. Um, I've got this other book that I've been wanting to read, which if I did not have children, I could do. Um, but um, he, uh, he was ridiculed for his view of Scripture. I mean, he was considered something of a Luddite as he was putting these talks out. Something of what? Something of a Luddite, L-U-D-D-I-T-E, uh, a dull person, a behind the times, not very smart because he was not up on the latest of biblical higher criticism scholarship. And he did not necessarily believe in all of those newfangled theologies that were coming out of the seminaries in Europe and infecting Germany, by the way. Yay, Germans. Germany gave a lot of weird stuff to the world. But Lutheranism got it right. Just everything after that got a little weird. Um, so... Just remember, German, Germany gave us the veto. And that's... Sauerkraut and bratwurst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sauerkraut, <laughs> sauerkraut and bratwurst. That's all we need. What? Oh, duh. I was thinking VW. What is VW? Who are you, Mary? <laughs> Mary's having a rough time today. I am. Have another drink. So no. are there <laughs> any other questions on this chapter? Anything that I've skipped over? Anything vitally important? Or are we all just happy we got our brains going today? And I know I am. I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to jumpstart this whole brain thing again, but I feel pretty good. You were great, Jim. Yes. <sighs> all right. No more questions? You're sitting there with all the answers. Actually, you should sound I, 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 I should write out an answer sheet to some of these <laughs> questions because sometimes I look at them and say, what was I thinking? <laughs> all right. Why don't we close with a word of prayer and then we will get on with our week. Father, Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the fellowship we have uh, we have enjoyed, and we just ask that you bring us back next week. Keep us whole. Keep us safe. Let us just continue this reading, and just bring us here to worship you in spirit and in truth. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.